crisp specimen of the kind of binding done in Ireland in the middle of the 18th century. Quite easily distinguishable from the binding done anywhere else, and in its technical quality, as good as anything done in any other European country during the 18th century. Up on the north side of Dublin, behind Mountjoy Square in Belvedere Court, is the workshop of John Newman and Son, craft bookbinders. John Newman is the owner and head of the firm, and Des Breen is the general manager in charge of the craft binding division. A customer wants a modern printed book put into a special binding. Theresa Keane has been with the firm since she was 14. She sets up the sewing frame. The gatherings are lined up and put into a press so that the three saw cuts can be made in the back to take the recessed cords. Each gathering of leaves must be individually secured by sewing with linen thread to the three recessed hemp cords. Nearly all the books we handle today are in fact folded, sewn and cased by machinery. The handcrafted binding is a rarity, but it is of much sounder construction than the ordinary books we buy. Des Breen looks through the illustrations of the book in search of a suitable theme to suggest the design of the finished cover. He finds it in a map of Acapulco, which will be translated into a mosaic of coloured leathers. First he must make a rough sketch, remembering that it must form the upper cover, wrap round the back, and continue over the lower cover. He works out his colour scheme using felt pens. Now he must make an accurate template or pattern from which he will work. The book now passes to Desi Smith, who puts it in a lying-in press so that he can use the plough, which is a kind of plane, to make the top edge regular and smooth to be gilded. The plough and the lying-in press are not very often used nowadays. The only country in Europe which has had a continuous tradition of fine bookbinding from the Middle Ages to the present day is France. It's all the more remarkable that for a short period in the middle of the 18th century, in the words of the greatest living English expert, Dublin vied with Paris for the leadership of the art. This is real gold leaf. The slightest puff of air will blow it away. Gold is an incredibly ductile metal. A cubic inch of it can be beaten out so thin that it will easily cover the floor of a good-sized room. Desi lays it on a pad of chamois leather and cuts it into sections. Gold leaf is extremely fragile and disintegrates easily. Often the pad is surrounded by a protective windbreak of cardboard. He uses the slight greasiness of his own hair to lift the gold. Now he paints the top edge with glare, which is white of egg and acts as an adhesive. He must lay the gold leaf on quickly before the glare dries.
presses it home deftly with a burnisher through a piece of thin paper. In the old days, when there might be many books lined up, and one person, perhaps an apprentice, on this job and nothing else for weeks on end, it could be very hard indeed on the shoulders. Beeswax is rubbed on a piece of chamois leather and over the gold. This helps to lubricate the agate-tipped burnisher, which is used across the grain of the leaves to polish the gold. Rounding and jointing come next. If the back of the book were to be left flat, it would very soon be distorted in use and the pages would sag outwards in an unsightly way. So it is hammered round to prevent this and put back into the press and hammered again so as to make the recesses into which the upper and lower boards will fit snugly. The three cords can be seen sticking out on both sides. Teresa sews on the head and tail bands, which are of goatskin backed with vellum and whipped round with silk in two colours. In inferior work these are often false, but not here. Here they are securely attached and give the book strength at the place where it is liable to be pulled off the shelf. Desi Smith chops the boards for the cover to size. Des Breen will take over now. Des uses the template as a pattern to trace around. And will then cut out the shape. This job is called pasting up. Now he laminates together the three boards. This will give them strength and also the depth needed for the relief effect of the map. The boards are put in a bench press to be stuck or nipped. The edges are beveled with a very sharp knife to give a cushioned effect. He punches the holes for the bands and makes little grooves for the bands to lie snugly in. The ends of the bands are frayed out, which is called flossing, so that they will lie down smoothly. In some old books, they show very clearly under the leather. The cords are tapped with a hammer into the holes and grooves. Now at last we come to the actual leather, Morocco, that's to say goatskin, of contrasting colours. One for the sea, one for the land, and one for the road. Pieces are cut out with a sharp knife 
leaving a margin around the templates. This margin is then skived to reduce the thickness of the leather and make a scarf joint and to keep it thin where it is turned around the edges of the boards. The leather is finally stuck onto the boards. A bone folder, which is a personal tool often made by the bookbinder himself, is used to shape the leather over the edge of the board. The moisture in the paste has made the leather more easily worked. He nips the leather in around the head cap. The leather for the island is called an onlay. It is now time for the sea to be dropped into place. By using the blue leather slightly oversized, he is able to put a ripple into it which gives the effect of waves. The marbled papers for the end papers are now chosen. These are made in Italy, England or France. The function of the end papers is to cover up the leather where it is turned in inside the boards to give a neat appearance and to ease the transition from the rigid covers to the flexible leaves. Another area of the bindery where the heated tools are used. From now on the various processes are collectively called finishing and are all more or less decorative in their purpose and effect. The structural parts are called forwarding and they are now over. Gold foil is laid over the part of the design to be gilded. It is essential to get the temperature and the pressure of the tool exactly right. Too hot and the gold will craze and the leather be burned. Too cool and it will not stick properly and sooner or later it will come off. Brass letters for the title are assembled in a handheld chase, which must also be heated. Des Breen has decided to do the lettering in blind, that is to say, without using gold leaf. First, he must accurately work out the spacing for the words of the title. The back has been slightly damped so that the leather will darken when the hot letters are applied. Lettering and blind is a very tricky job and calls for a steady hand because the same impressions must be gone over several times and any imprecision would be disastrous. The impression of the little fort is slightly damped and then deepened. It's nearly finished then, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a few mm -hmm. small touches on it. I see, yeah. Say. We should be able to get it away to him next week, perhaps? Yeah. It's very nice. I'm very pleased with it anyway. That's great. Marsh's Library, the oldest public library in Ireland, dating back to 1702 and containing several valuable collections of books. Inevitably, some of these require repair and restoration. Mrs. Muriel McCarthy, the librarian. Yeah, uh, I think we have about 20, yeah. but I have a complete list with instructions, Des, yeah. which I'll give you. But I would like to, would you mind if I discuss some of them no, with sure, you? Because sure, yeah. they're a bit special. Sure. Um, first of all, this one, as you can see, Des, both covers 
are off entirely. Yeah. And I'm afraid it also needs Sewing. to be uh, resewn. Yeah. Okay. Exactly as it was originally, yeah. uh, of course. And the other thing too is headbands, head and tail bands. Yeah. That's the original headband. But uh, is that possible to use that again? I would retain the core, but... Uh, oh, that's all? That's all. Because we'd like to keep as much as possible, yeah, fine. as you know. Now, the other one, Des, is a little bit uh, difficult because only one cover, which is very typical of most yeah, of the song. Yeah. But also, if you could, can you reinsert those chords? Because it doesn't have to be re-sewn. Yeah, fine. We can put slips on them and... Uh... Now, the important thing about this book is, is that uh, nothing else is to be done with it because of this particular annotation. Although it looks unimportant, in fact, it really is extremely important Who's because there? of this. We can tell the whole history of the book from that from tiny own, yeah. uh, annotation. You see, it's 25, 6, 51, CB, yeah. 1 and 3. So we know now that that means the 25th of the 6th, 1651, and the CB is Cornelius B, 1 and 3. That's the London bookseller, and he paid 1 and 3 uh, for that little book. At Newman's, the books must first be put into a fumigation chamber, where for a fortnight they are subjected to the vapour from crystals of thymol, which will kill all moulds, insects such as bookworms and silverfish, and other pests. The old animal glue is steamed off the back of a book to be repaired, using an ordinary kettle and scraped away with a knife. The book will then be rebacked with new leather. Carlo Grady is an expert in restoration work. Old pages sometimes need to be cleaned. This is the portrait of Dennis Hempson from Bunting's second volume of the Ancient Music of Ireland. Sometimes a kind of dry cleaning is used by means of draft cleaning powder, which lifts the stains without removing old inscriptions. By water came the stain on this plate of the doorway harp, and by water it departs. There's the engraved title page. The stain removed. Richard Ferns specializes in the repair of paper. He selects a sheet of long fibered Japanese rice paper. It must not be cut out to make the repair but carefully pricked around in a shape which will mate with the torn original. And then itself must be torn so as to retain the strength of the long overlapping fibers. In the restoration of old and valuable books, only natural, water-soluble adhesives and animal glues must be used. Often the pages of old books which have become weakened through use are reinforced by a strip of special paper which is laminated by heat to the edge of the old page. Finally, the surplus is trimmed off. <laughs> Kahalo Grady is taking the decorated back off an old binding. Using a very sharp knife with surgical skill. This is a very time-consuming job and calls for incredible concentration and patience. But he gets it off in one piece, like a man shearing a sheep.
Now the new leather is wrapped round the back and tucked in under the old, like the lead flashing on a roof. The leather is nipped in over the six bands with a pair of special band nipping pliers. Finally, the old back is put on again. The same process that we saw before, with gold leaf and glare, is being used for the lettering of the title of this old book. Noel Dunn takes the tool off the heater, cools it, and applies it, rocking it slightly. The surplus gold is removed. and the hole tidied up, and very neat it looks. These are Victorian decorative tools, mostly of the romantic kind, incorporating interlace and other motifs from the High Crosses and the Book of Kells. Latin decoration. There's a triquetra. The tools used by the 18th century Irish binders were quite different from these, but even more distinctively Irish. An ornamental flower is put in the centre of a panel. The individually hand-bound book is a rarity today, but the same skills are needed for the repair and restoration of older bindings, and so the continuity of the craft is assured. Monday at 7.30, but after the break, it looks like Dennis might have blood on his hands in the East End.